I accidentally muted myself. My bad. The only philosophy you should be following is Jesus Christ. Yeah, I think that's probably right. I, I do think that is uh, pretty right. Um, so yeah, I don't know if I want to start. Do I want to start right away? I don't know. I'm muted? I shouldn't be now. I fixed it. The philosophy you should be following is me and only me. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's fair enough. Um, we're going to be doing, or I'm going to be doing, sort of a brief lecture on Kant. Uh, if you don't know anything about Kant, that's totally fine. Um, any lecture on Kant is sort of also going to entail a lecture on, like, Descartes and, and Hume and stuff, right? So, it'll be a multifaceted uh, lecture. Uh, and at any time, if it's seeming too inex or too yeah too inaccessible or too confusing, um, you know, just feel free to to let me know. Um, you can either use this to learn. You could use this as a as a sleeping aid. For some reason, it got like really dark. So let's do that. Um, you're already confused. Is this too bright now? I should adjust. Um, Kant's the guy that thought time and space didn't exist outside of us, but we put it there, right? Yes, that's exactly right. Kant believed that space and time are simply forms, or a priori forms of our intuition. What is that sound? Is there sound? Here, wait, let me do this. There, maybe it'd be a little bit better. How's that? Does this sound better now? I hope this intro lecture is just a long and extremely dense rant about the two objects interpretation. Yeah. Yeah, well, we'll be talking about the two world, two aspect uh, interpretations. I'm going to be giving an interpretation that's two aspect view. Um, so if that's not your jam, then I don't know. Am I a descendant of Kant? Uh, no. As far as I know, I don't think so. Are you also an instrumentalist about historic claims that things like the fall of Rome didn't actually happen, but they are constructed theories with predictive value of what we dig up next? Um... No, I don't, I don't really think history has laws, so the answer to that would be no. Um, not that I agree, just an interesting factoid. Oh, yeah, about Ayn Rand, yeah. The downfall, the downfall of knowledge. Kant was all about the feels and not about the reals. Hmm. I was just joking, nice that you'll actually cover that. Well, I don't think there's any real way for me to give an introduction to Kant without taking a stand in how to interpret him as either a dual aspect theorist or a dual world theorist. Hey, George, thanks so much for the for the sub. Clap, 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 clap. Thank you very much. Um, we're gonna be starting soon. I think we should just react to LSF. Uh, <laughs> hmm. I don't know. I don't know. So no Hell's Kitchen? No, I don't think so. I don't think Hell's Kitchen. If we use scientific techniques like carbon dating to determine history and your scientific anti-realist, shouldn't that transfer onto historical claims though too? Uh, sure, but we can make claims without using something just like carbon dating. That is an interesting question, though, the relationship between carbon dating and historical claims, if you're a scientific anti-realist. Um, if it meshes well with our theories and is instrumental in making predictions, then I think carbon dating would be fine. But at the same time, we use methods other than 
theories involving scientific entities to make claims about history, right? Like primary documentation and whatnot. So that would presumably, presumably, uh, so while certain scientific or historical claims might be dependent upon certain claims about scientific entities, they aren't all. So I wonder how that would divide up. I have to think about that. Um, anyway, sorry. Uh, Antiox, hey, thanks so much for the sub. Seven months? Wow. Seven whole months. Hey, here's to seven more, hopefully. <laughs> um, what do you think Kant would say about DMCA laws? I think Kant would sooner, would sooner kill himself than um, live in a world with DMCA laws. I think he'd hate them. I think he'd see them as an affront to justice. I don't fucking know. I don't know anything about what Khan would have thought about copyright and DMCA laws and trademark stuff. Uh, do you also think that theories in two scientific domains don't have to be consistent with each other or unified as long as they are predictive in their own sphere, or do they have to mesh? I don't think they have to mesh, no. Um, I don't believe in scientific reductionism, so, yeah. Um, hey, question mark philosophy, how are you doing? You tell me what a categorical imperative is. Um, it's probably best understood by contrasting it with an instrumental imperative, um, which holds that you ought to do something relative to a certain end that you have. So, for example, if my end is to make money, then one means to that end would be getting a job, for example. The question is, are there certain ends that we all ought to aspire to, default ends that are not dependent upon our own personal desires and psychological states, but are reliant upon something uh, not necessarily external to the mind, but somehow necessary, either necessary to the mind or, yes, external to the mind, depending on what kind of meta-ethics you want to take, but... Uh, do you value reductionism? Like, it's not necessary, but it's probably more efficient? Or, like, are you opposed to it? Uh, d totally depends on the domain. It really just depends on the domains. You know? I don't think I could answer that as, like, a broad... I, I don't think I could give a generalized answer for that. You know? Have you ever studied Hegel? I've studied a bit of Hegel, but not nearly enough to give, like, a lecture on it. I read like a bit of a science, the science of logic. I read his lectures on history. Um, I've read like maybe a hundred pages total of phenomenology, but it's never interested me all that much. So I've studied the late German idealists, like Trendelenburg and stuff. Intro to Heidegger at some point in the future, maybe, maybe. Have you studied religious philosophers like Aquinas? Uh, not systematically, only like specific relationships that they have towards certain disputes. What about Spinoza? Same with Spinoza. Well, also, isn't carbon dating were necessary for dating when the primary sources were written? Can't just always trust the data written on it because maybe it uses a different calendar system or is writing science fiction. Or some shit where the dates are unreliable. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess so. But, I mean, we, we can, like, for example, we can look at, we can look at how fragments have developed over time based on when they were. And we know that we've had a consistent calendar system in most places for a long time. And we know how to convert most major calendar systems, at least in the West. So, I mean, yeah, it's... Again, it's just totally contextual dependent, you know? Voltaire, I've read some Voltaire. I've read Candide and stuff. Um, Ephraim told me Spinoza was evil and loves to Satan. Uh, right, well, I wouldn't listen to Infrared on anything about philosophy, so... Yeah, that that's that's my own advice there. Freud's a great example of history and science not being the same. The oral his, uh, story far predated the scientific confirmation. Yeah. 
Well, do we want to jump into this now, or should we wait a bit longer, or or what? What, what do we think? Because um, I don't want to start without, like, the regulars, you know. Am I remembering correctly that you agree with Parfit the most when it comes to normative ethics? Um, yeah, I used to be a Parf Parfitian uh, pluralist, but I mean, I don't, I don't do a lot of normative ethics now. I, I study mostly meta ethics, so but yeah, I've always been a fan of Parfit, and I like the idea of Parfitian pluralism, but I don't know if it's actually possible, really. Didn't Spinoza say he didn't believe in God, but kind of still did, because, like, God's, like, nature or anything or something like that? Yeah, I mean, he basically argues that there can only be one substance, and there must be, and the substance must be in infinite and indivisible, and therefore it is God. But if there's one substance, that means all material reality is of that substance as well, therefore God is also the substance of material reality. Better ethics is more interesting than normative ethics. I am a, yeah, 1000% agree. I 100% I, I agree with that. I do not find, um, <laughs> I don't find, uh, what do you call it? Normative ethics all that uh, riveting, you know? But, you know, to each their own, you know? Alright, we'll, we'll start in like one or two minutes here. Would Plato's dialogues on like justice and stuff be considered meta-ethics or just ethics? Probably just ethics. Although, mm, the relationship between justice and ethics, well, would it be political philosophy is the question. That, that That's kind of like a semantical thing. You find it in both areas. Um, I'd say it's more political philosophy and normative ethics than... Um, Yeah, someone linked my stream and said free melatonin. <laughs> Holy shit, that's hilarious. Um, because it isn't just talking about what to do to obtain justice, but what justice actually is. Right, I getcha. Okay, so let's start out. I'm just going to give kind of a background to Kant, who of course was the German philosopher from the 18th century Enlightenment period, um, incredibly revolutionary, I would say probably the most important philosopher of all time in terms of influence, in terms of originality. Um, ultimately, that doesn't really matter, but that's my own personal, uh, my own personal opinion of Kant. Uh, I know some people really don't like Kant. But, you know, to each his own. Um, the background should probably begin with Descartes, um, who is well known as a substance dualist, which means that he believed there were two existing substances in the world, one physical and one mental, and you are able to uh, interact with these substances uh, well, I'm able to interact with the material substance essentially through the pineal gland, which is this part of the brain that connects the material world to the mental world. And this is just his picture of metaphysics. Uh, we obviously know that doesn't make any sense at all, um, because the pineal gland is not some magical, uh, mystical link uh, between the, uh, the mental and physical worlds. Uh, but it was the most convenient way for him to essentially justify his substance dualism without doing any really hard thinker or hard thinking. Um, and contrasted with someone like Descartes, we have people like John Locke um, and David Hume who were materialists and believed that there was only one uh, metaphysical substance, namely just material reality, uh, this mental realm. 
um, isn't something that actually exists. Uh, that's just religious scholastical dogma uh, from long, long ago. Um, so that was the background metaphysical dispute um, that lasted a long time. Uh, and then essentially Kant came along and said, well, you're just going about philosophy incorrectly. Um, you aren't really engaging with the base foundational issues that we have to be dealing with if we want to get at what is necessarily true in the first place. So looking at someone like Descartes, who, whose you know, book is titled Meditations on First Philosophy, this is where we start from. He begins with this method of doubt by doubting everything that exists in the world and coming to conclude from this that necessarily there has to be a god. Um, you know, he begins by doubting the existence of the material world, uh, by considering things like optical illusions that exist, the possibility that we're always in a dream, the possibility that an evil demon is always there deceiving us, etc. Then, of course, you get to his famous cogito, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. And that solidifies our first necessary um, piece of knowledge. And it's from that um, that Descartes sort of secures the rest of the world for us. So Descartes isn't actually a skeptic. Um, he is aimed specifically at refuting skepticism, the kind of skepticism that came out of the French uh, period, uh, the French early modern period, uh, with people like Michel de Montaigne um, in his really large collection of essays that were getting a little even atheistic at times. Now, that's you know, Kant thinks that's great. I love the idea of this. I love the idea of being skeptical and really pushing our way all the way to the beginning so that we can derive everything from something that's absolutely necessary. But Kant saw the rationalists like Descartes and Leibniz and Leibniz is probably the better example than Descartes because they have Kant is critiquing Leibniz's and Newton's uh, conceptions of space. But Regardless, you have the rationalist, the, the, the substance dualists on the one side and the hardcore empiricist materialists uh, on the other. And Kant is essentially saying to both of these, well, well, you're going about this the wrong way. Let's talk about the methodology by which we actually begin talking about metaphysics. And a lot of people refer to Kant's project as uh, the Copernican it's, it's the Copernican revolution of philosophy, or it's also called the epistemological churn, because essentially what Descartes and Hume and every philosopher before Kant did was sort of take for granted um, that we are just receivers of stuff external to us. We are just sort of a vessel and we are just getting data input to us over and over and over again, Okay. And it's from this data that we get that we can derive certain philosophical conclusions. You know, that, that's what Descartes is doing. That's what Locke is doing. Uh, you know, Locke's arguments against innateness is literally, uh, he argued against the idea that there are these innate principles and mathematical truths that we all know uh, by essentially pointing to stupid people in the world. So he's using the metaphysical data that we're getting from our experiences to disprove different theories. And Kant wants to say, well, look, like, we, we shouldn't be taking this stuff for granted. If we want, you know, like Descartes, we have to, in a sense, be very skeptical and only start out with what we know for absolutely 100% certain. And the way that we can do that is through the transcendental method. And the transcendental method is essentially looking at what is necessary in the first place to have experience. Okay. Another way to put this would be to say that we have certain epistemic conditions as, as human beings, as rational agents. For, for Kant, it's human beings, but I mean, we could extend it to all rational agents who cognize the world like we do. Um, and an epistemic condition is essentially a necessary condition for us to represent objects in the world, right? Like we all acknowledge that we are representing objects, right? I'm representing my mind is representing 
this little bottle of glue. It's representing chat on my screen. It's representing this cup of water. It's representing, you know, my microphone. But the question is, what is necessary to do this in the first place? So because we can all agree that we're representing things, right? We're not making any commitments about what the types of objects these are. We're not, we're not saying whether they're appearing to us in dreams. We're not saying that they're hard material objects out there. You know, we're not saying anything about them possibly being illusions or not being illusions. We just are saying that we're representing something. The nature of what we're representing is sort of up for grabs, okay? But what Kant wants to point us to is to say, to say that we are obviously representing things and let's look at what is necessary to represent things in the first place. And these are these epistemic uh, conditions. So when we consider these conditions, what becomes fundamental? What becomes fundamental is essentially how these conditions that we have can both be subjective and objective at the same time. Um, because we are, you know, we as human beings, if, if we've started from the very get go and we're just thinking about how we're representing objects, we can't take for granted the existence of other people, right? This is a purely internal endeavor that Kant is taking us on. We're starting from our own internal cognitive processes and then sort of working outwards. Okay. And that means that we're acknowledging, in a sense, the subjectivity of what we're discussing. But subjectivity doesn't mean not necessary. It doesn't mean contingent. It just means it is relegated to the subject. It is internal. It is an internal process. But from this subjectivity comes objectivity. It's essentially what Kant is going to say. Um, because for any human being that exists or any rational agent that exists... As long as we, you know, make charitable assumptions that people operate sort of in the same way we do, which is a fair thing that we can grant, then it means that everyone is a subjective agent that is still representing the world in the same ways. Okay, so what are the subjective epistemic conditions that we hold? Well, Kant wants to look to things like the way we represent objects in space uh, as one such example. And he wants to argue against, um, the, you know, the notion developed by Isaac Newton that space is sort of an external thing in the world and wants to say instead that space is actually an a priori condition of our sensibilities, which is to say you can imagine it almost, th this is the best way it's ever explained to me, you can imagine the human mind sort of like, um, well, imagine, you know, you have an output let me let me see where so you have so okay so you have an input here which is going to be the raw sensory data that you're getting from the world okay and then this is going to be your output over here which is what we're seeing hearing feeling and smelling and so on right and so Kant wants to essentially say that in this process there's a filter there's a filter right here that comes from well, I'll filter here, and it comes from the data, it goes through the filter, and then, you know, we get our representations. But this filter, this filter is something internal to us. This is a necessary part of the mind, which is called the sensibility. And so our mind, our sensibility, which is how we receive information, is essentially going to represent things in space at this point, and then that's how it's represented. But prior to this, we can't say anything about how these objects are. We can't say that these objects are, you know, spatially located such and such places. It's it's an a priori form. These are the fancy words that he's using um, to essentially just say it's it's a necessary filter that we human beings are applying to our external stimuli uh, to generate the representations that we have. Okay. How does Kant avoid solipsism? How is it not just an assumption that we are all rational agents living in this intersubjective world? It's not, well, we will get to that, okay? I, I, oops. My bad. Uh, we, I, I will get to that. I will get to exactly how Kant's thesis is a refutation of, of skepticism. Um, 
But let's let's then just sort of talk about what, what ultimately idealism is then for Kant, because Kant is a transcendental idealist. And you'll hear there aren't very many anymore. I probably would consider myself a transcendental idealist on some days and probably not on others. Um, doesn't he say the same thing about time? That's what that's where it's more most confusing. Yeah, he also says that we yes, that is I, I try to avoid time because it is more confusing. So let me know at the end and maybe I can come back to that. But let's just focus on space for now. Um, I'm not I'm not trying to go into the nitty gritty details of anything. I'm trying to give sort of just a broad overview of his project and why he's so revolutionary. Um, but like, so Kant is a transcendental idealist and he's an idealist because he's essentially saying that the concepts that we place objects under, like something being a chair, something being a cup, something being red, something being soft, something being brown, okay? These concepts and actually the representations that we form are relativized to our own human cognition, right? And that follows very simply from this filter picture that I, that I was giving you, right? where you have the input on this side and the output on this side, and the human mind, the cognition, is filtering the objects, well, they're this way, filtering the objects through here and generating the outputs, uh, which are representations for us as human beings. And that's what makes him a transcendental idealist, because the human mind is fundamentally what is capable of representing objects to us and allowing us to form judgments about those objects, okay? So that's very different from sort of a direct model where the objects that we see are just what they are out there in the world, right? So think about someone like Locke who is just going to say, well, when I see, actually, it's a little complicated. I don't want to butcher all the early modern stuff. Uh, so maybe let's not say someone like Locke, but consider someone um, who is a direct realist. That's what that's a position in, in the philosophy of perception, um, which essentially holds that when I see something, I am literally seeing that object, right? I'm looking at this object and it's, you know, I'm just capable of literally having sort of a window into the world. But for Kant, we don't have that type of window because the window itself, it, it's more like, um, it's more like a, a video camera and we're applying the human mind is what's generating the image. Does that make sense? The human mind is what generates the image based on this raw sense data, but we never have any real access to what lies behind the sense data. We as human beings are stuck at the other side. We're stuck at the output and we can never access what's actually at the input. Okay? So, that's why he is a transcendental idealist, because he relativizes, um, he relativizes um, the formation of concepts and representations of objects to the human cognition, as opposed to positing that we have direct access to our objects, okay? So everyone's sort of on, on board. If, it, if you don't understand, like, my, my, again, my purpose is not here to, you, you shouldn't be able to regurgitate what an a priori form of representation is, right? That's not, that's not what I'm going after, but I'm trying to paint the broad abstract picture of what Kant is trying to do. And so as long as you understand that for Kant, the very way that we experience objects is mediated through the human self. I mean, that, that's, that's the key takeaway. Uh, will Trainwreck TV be making a guest appearance on the subject of Kant? I don't know. Maybe. You should reach out to him and ask him. <laughs> um, okay, cool. So one quote that I have um, from Henry Allison, um, who is a probably my favorite interpreter of Kant. Uh, he says, The claim is not that things transcending the human cognition cannot exist but merely that such things cannot count as objects for us. So I'm going to reiterate it one more time so people can really get it, okay? We've got the input here, okay? And we've got the output. Kant is not claiming that there aren't objects on the other side, okay? 
only that the raw objects, what Kant calls the things in themselves, or the noumena, or the transcendental object, those things all really mean separate things, but for us, let's just treat them the same. These things in themselves, these noumena, they, they exist. They're out there. But we as human beings can never have direct access to them. We only have access to them through our own cognitive functions, which in a sense masks the possibility of ever knowing what these objects are truly like in the first place. Okay, so these objects, these raw input, cannot be objects for us. Because for something to be an object, we have to have already represented it for us in human cognition. And by that point, we're already at the output stage where we've gone through the filter of the human cognition. We've gone through the priori forms of space and time. And the pure categories of the understanding and yada yada, right? Would this mean that illusions aren't things, but just different ways to access the raw objects? Um, well, no, because, so, no, well, here's, here's a great, so the answer to that would be no, because when we're talking about illusion, when we say that something is an illusion, it's an illusion relative to some type of concept or some set of objects that we've represented already. So it's an illusion relative to our representations on the output side. It's not an illusion relative to what's over here. It's not an illusion relative to the things in themselves. It's an illusion relative to what the representations that we've already made of the world after it's been filtered through our, you know, the forms of, of sensibility and whatnot. And so does that make sense? Yes, exactly. Locke is an indirect realist, which is why I hesitated to ascribe to him an indirect realist uh, a position. But yeah, that's right. Indir Locke is an indirect realist. Uh, actually, both Locke and uh, Descartes are very similar to each other on most issues. Uh, there's actually not all that much uh, difference between them, to be honest. Um, yeah, so d does that make sense to you, Occam's Razor, Scooter? What's the point of saying there exists these in imperceivable raw objects if the only way we can know it and the only way it has properties is if we can see them? Well, there's no... I don't know if you're asking for a pragmatic or practical point. There's not. It's just simply that they necessarily have to exist. For us to have any sort of knowledge, it has to be coming from somewhere. That just follows from basic necessities of causation um but what kant was doesn't want to do is fall into the trap that previous philosophers did and commit themselves in a sense to having real concrete knowledge of the things in themselves because all we can do is understand what would be necessary in the first place to have knowledge of objects and once we've done that we've already gone past the point of talking about the things in themselves in the first place we can talk about what is possible for us to represent objects in our own experience. But we can't say what lies beyond the human experience. There's nothing beyond the human experience except understanding, which is our own manipulation of information in our mind and these representations that we formulated. But we can never really know if our representations are accurate, whatever that ultimately means, uh, accurate depictions of the things in themselves. We can only know that there are certain necessary ways that we as human beings represent these objects. But whether this, it, you know, so Kant is going to leave open the possibility that there could be some higher being, maybe some kind of alien, that has different forms of sensibility, has different ways of representing objects. Okay? I, I don't know if he'd ever, I don't think he'd ever allow for someone to directly perceive the things in themselves, though. I don't know if he ever talks about that. Um, if there's an object A and object B, and person A sees object A in a certain way, and person B sees object B in the same way as A sees A, then what's the difference between object A and B? Uh, 
Sorry, it, it's hard to because you've used A to refer to two different things. A and B and seeing object A and B differently. Are A and B the same object or are they different objects? Yeah, I, try to rephrase it. I might be able um, to answer. Okay, but there's something more. We need something more than just these epistemic conditions, okay? We need what is called discursivity, okay? And to say that human cognition is discursive is essentially to claim that it requires both concepts and sensible intuition. Now, that's the fancy talk for it. But it's essentially to say, in order to have any sort of thought, any thought at all, we need two things, okay? We need this raw data that we're getting from the input, okay? And we need concepts, okay? And let's think about concepts very generally here, okay? Like the concept red, for example, okay? So we've got raw data coming in, and then we apply the object red, boom, we represent a red object, okay? That's the only way that the human mind can have thoughts is by applying concepts to the data that comes in and generating representations at the other side. That is the discursivity thesis. You cannot have thought. You cannot have thought without, without concepts for them to fall under. Okay? That's incredibly crucial. Um... Does that make sense too? Uh, person one sees object A just like person two sees object B. What's the difference between A and B being the same object and object A and B being different but observe similarly? Well, I mean, if they if they appear absolutely identical under all circumstances, then they are probably the same object relative to these people, right? But I mean, if there's some higher agent that sees, like, I don't I don't really know. I would assume, oh, yeah, I mean, if you're asking about the actual fundamental nature of those objects, yeah, we can't say anything about them. We can't say anything about them. So Skanabulis would be right there. Is the data coming in also a thing in itself? Uh, no. <laughs> Took me a moment, but no. Uh, so intellectual intuition is impossible. Yes, that's correct. You can't have any thought at all without sensory input. Without intuition, which is the same as the sort of sensory data input that I'm talking about, there, yes, there, there's no, there, there's no thought at all. There always has to be something coming in. Um, so it's an interesting thing to consider, you know, we have these ideas of, what if you're born without any of your senses? Are you able to think? You know, that that's sort of where those questions start to arise. So we could be observing two different realities or two same realities, but we wouldn't know. Yeah, that's right. That's right, Occam's Razor. But what Kant is going to say is that those questions that you're considering are essentially useless. Like, we never have access to something outside of that, or outside of our own representations, um, that... You know, that in a sense, it's a, it's a type of skepticism, but the skepticism is kind of, well, look, I'll, I'll get into the skepticism later. This will all get answered, um, answered later, okay? You're, you're, you're starting to go after sort of the, the skeptical question of how Kant deals with skepticism, which, I, which I'll get to, um, which comes into like how to interpret Kant. Um, Uh, let me see. Um, just going through my notes here. Okay, so, sorry. Uh, no, no, those, they are not useless questions. I just wanted to think about what I want to say next. So, you, you, someone asked a question about whether we are able to directly, like, it, whether or not data coming in is, is a thing in itself. And I think that's an interesting question because for Kant, we want to understand, uh, intuition as something that is in a sense sort of 
pre-ordered, okay? Um, it's, it's combined in a way that our mind is able to comprehend it and output a representation, okay? And so there are two alternatives to this. The first is that we directly are intuiting things in themselves. Um, but for Kant, that doesn't make any sense because then, then concepts uh, and the role of understanding plays no role because if we're intuiting things in themselves, then all of a sudden we've, we've lost the possibility for doubt. We've lost the possibility for any, like if we're directly experiencing the objects themselves, there's, there's no possibility for these mistaken uh, cases that we encounter um, in life. Uh, and also there's no possibility for genuine understanding uh, through the synthesis of different objects. That's a bit complicated. I can go into it more if you want, but I think that's less important than the other alternative, which is essentially that uh, that we are just interpreting a string of data uh, without it going through um, going through a filter. That all we're getting is just a single single stream of data as as we look around, as we hear things or whatever, and that's what we are are getting. He wants to say that it's just that doesn't make any sense because we inherently lose the objectivity that we necessarily have. Right? The fact that I'm able to recognize over and over and over again that an object is the same, despite my head being in a different location, despite lighting conditions being constantly different, the fact that I can represent objects um, and the fact that I can make thoughts about all of these objects clearly necessitates that there has to be some sort of uh, precognitive way that my mind is putting together the data. And that's what's going to be, that's what's found in the transcendental aesthetic, which are these a priori forms of, of space and time. So the information comes bundled in a way that we're able to understand it. And then the mind um, from the very get go is going to take this, what he calls this manifold of experience and generate a representation. And the objectivity that we have between all human agents is that we all have these same a priori forms of intuitions, the a priori forms of space and time, because we're going to be, re and that, that's why we're able to communicate with each other and sort of understand what, understand what we mean. And this is sort of my own personal take on Khan here, uh, and it comes from sort of my philosophy of language uh, leanings. Uh, but, the, but the fact that we're able to communicate with each other uh, pretty successfully um, and understand what I mean when I point to something and you're able to immediately agree with me on something, that seems to indicate that we share, we fundamentally share these um, that we share these a priori forms, this, this filter. Um, because if we didn't share this filter, it would be very difficult for us to understand how successful or why it is we're so successful at communicating thoughts that seem to be painstakingly true to one another. Uh, and yes, at any point, you can embrace some kind of like hyper, hyper um, uh, extreme skepticism, right? I mean, there's, there's never refuting any of that, I think. Um, but we can try to make our best guess uh, as to what's actually going on when we experience the world. And it seems to me, and it seemed to Kant, and it seems to, I think, most philosophers, that human beings, and maybe all rational agents, share this same filter, or what are called the priori forms of intuition. So that's why this, this just pure stream of raw data image uh, can't be correct, because it loses that objectivity that we share when we communicate with one another. So the filter is necessarily there. Also, the filter is argued on its own, uh, on on pain of of contradiction that like you can read the transcendental aesthetic if you want where he does argue that space is just a, a form of our a priori uh, a sensibility or is an a priori form of our sensibility and time is the same he gives positive arguments for those positions um, but I'm just trying to explain uh, why there has to be a filter in the first place um, is that does that make sense to people. I think that's the most boring part, uh, because the far more interesting part is sort of the meta metaphilosophical uh, questions, uh, which have to do a lot with skepticism and whatnot, right? Um, makes sense. Yes. So 
let's go sort of into this debate uh, that has taken place in Kant scholarship over the past 40 years, 30 to 40 years or so. Uh, and this is the difference between a two world view or two objects view uh, and a two aspect view or interpretation of Kant. Okay. I'm an adherent of the two aspect view, but let me give, let me try to give an explanation of what the two world view holds. The two world view essentially holds that there are two ontologically distinct sets of entities that exist. Okay. So under this view, there are the things in themselves and there are appearances. And it's been thought historically in Kant literature and especially right after Kant, I mean, people like Fichte and Schelling and Hegel had to grapple with this uh, two object problem. The thought was that the things in themselves, the things that lie behind our representations are they, they have to exist because they cause the appearances that we have. Okay. And the, the two, the two world view holds that these are two fundamentally distinct entities, one of which causes the other, but they are not the same. Okay. And it's very easy to see why this would result in a form of easy skepticism. Uh, and actually why it seems to be very confusing uh, and why perhaps idealism would be wrong. Because for Kant, we can't really say anything about the things in themselves except for the fact that they exist. And you can derive that simply from the fact that we have appearances. Something has to cause these, so it's going to be the things in themselves. But Kant seems to be going beyond that by positing a causal connection between the things in themselves and appearances, in which case he seems to contradict himself. Because you are saying something about the things in themselves, namely that they are the causes of, um, they are the causes of appearances and representations. Uh, and so that's Jacobi's um, dilemma, uh, or a very bastardized version of it, rather. Um, but I believe that the dual aspect view doesn't quite face the same issues. Um, I wonder if I should go into Jack White's dilemma a little bit more. Um, yeah, no, I, I won't go into it anymore. Yeah, Jack White's dilemma. It, it's essentially holding itself. So there are objects that are affecting us, right? The things in themselves. Um, and the affecting objects are things that are, that are sort of in space. Uh, and because in order for us to understand causation, right? Uh, causation seems to be a spatial phenomenon. Um, and so if appearances are things that are in space, which is what Kant wants to say, of course, and it, it's represented in space. If we're going to posit a causal affection between things and themselves and, and actual, uh, like representations that we've generated, um, then we are saying that things in themselves are seemingly, uh, spatiotemporal. Uh, wasn't that also the thing you were trying to explain to infrared? Yeah, probably. Oh yeah, probably. Yeah. The problem of affection. It's also called the problem of affection. Yes. Um, so the issue is that, well, I wonder if I should read the direct quote. The issue with reading any direct quotes is that no one will really understand what it means, but I could read it if you want. So one falls into the contradiction that a representation for the transcendental ego should afterwards serve as a thing in itself for the empirical ego, the effect of which produces in the ego above and beyond that transcendent representation of the object, an empirical representation of the very object. Um, that probably doesn't make any sense to anyone. Um, but 
Yeah, I, I feel like my uh, I I feel like my my explanation makes enough sense in that if we're gonna posit that you know this is affecting this, then this also has to be spatiotemporal. And if this is spatiotemporal, then what's really the distinction between these two things? If we're having causal knowledge of these representations, um, you are in a sense having a double affection in a certain sense because. If this is something, an object in space, like these things are, then this could seemingly generate its own appearances, and it sort of generates this infinite regress. And also, Kant contradicts himself because you're positing knowledge of other things themselves that you can't actually posit, namely that they are spatio-temporally represented. Okay? Um, yeah, you can just forget that, okay? I, that's, I wasn't planning to talk about it, but, but I thought I, I'd do it anyway. So, anyways... That, that's the two object view. The, the belief that these are two fundamentally different kinds of objects, one of which is causing the other. And the big problem was, well, how do you deal with the problem of affection? How do you deal with saying that this affects this and yet we have no knowledge of this? That, that just is, isn't apparently supposed to make sense. And to me, it doesn't really make sense. And that's why this two aspect view came along, which essentially says that there aren't two different kinds of objects, but actually there are two different ways of considering things. We can consider things as they appear to us, or we consider things as they actually are in themselves. So this is an epistemic thesis, an epistemological thesis, um, as opposed to an ontological thesis. So, yes, yeah, so what Allison says in, in his book is that this epistemologically based understanding of transcendental idealism requires that the transcendental distinction between appearances and things in themselves be understood as holding between two ways of considering things. Um, and, and such cognition is fully objective since it is governed by a priori epistemic conditions. Okay, so now that we've laid the groundwork for this, I want to show how truly powerful this position is because one of the primary issues that a traditional two-world reading of Kant faces is that if we're acknowledging that our appearances are caused by something we can't have knowledge of, how is any of this objective? Where is, where is the objectivity coming from? Isn't this purely subjective? Doesn't this generate a ton of skepticism? Can't I look at these objects over here and be like, well, how do I know that these are accurate representations of what is over here? How do I know that my friend is not interpreting the things in themselves in a completely different way than I am when I'm getting these representations? Well, by taking a dual aspect interpretation of Kant, you just completely sidestep this issue because what is very crucial is that cognizing things as they appear to us, thinking about things as they appear to us over here is still objective. In fact, it's the only thing that can be objective because it is this that is governed by these a priori epistemic conditions. Stuff like what's found in the transcendental aesthetic, like the a priori forms of space and time and the pure categories of the understanding. Stuff has to, you know, for example, um, anything that we interpret can't violate the law of contradiction. Boom, that goes right in the center. It goes into our filter. Anything that comes in from this side cannot appear to be both red and not red, okay? So we don't know what this data is, but we sure as hell know that it doesn't violate the law of contradiction. Everything that we get is either going to be red or it's not going to be red, okay? Maybe there is some kind of creature out there that is able to interpret things and not have to follow this law of contradiction. Maybe something can interpret things as both red and not red. Kant doesn't know. He doesn't make any commitments about that. All he's saying is that objectivity comes for us because there are these a priori, which means prior to experience, epistemic conditions, namely conditions that we all have to have in order to have knowledge about things at all. And that's where the objectivity arises. And so when people are being skeptical, the question you need to ask them is, well, you're, what are you being skeptical relative to? Do you want to take the transcendental standpoint and talk about the relationship between the objects um, as they are things in themselves? Or are you skeptical relative to what's happened after we've cognized objects 
through our a priori epistemic conditions. Because if you're being skeptical about this side, about things after they've been cognized and represented to us, then that's that's a legitimate discussion we can have. But if you want to be skeptical and just simply point to the fact that we don't know what things are in themselves, well, fine. <laughs> that's all good. Everyone's going to agree on that. But that's not where objectivity arises. Objectivity only comes after we've represented objects. Okay? Does that make sense? And I think a fantastic way to represent this point is by representing stuff in science and scientific knowledge in this way. So I wrote a really long paper probably a year ago essentially arguing um, arguing that we should interpret um, the philosopher and historian of science, Thomas Kuhn, uh, as essentially advocating something like Allison's dual aspect view and interpretation of Kant. So the scientist um, undergoes, or scientists throughout history have undergone what we've called scientific paradigms, okay? So an example of this would be the shift from the Ptolemaic model of astronomy, which believed that the Earth was at the center of the universe, actually was a bit off the center of the of, of universe, um, as opposed to the Copernican model, which of course held that the sun was in the center of the galaxy and we rotated around the sun and so on. Um, now, the first paradigm, the Ptolemaic one, gave rise to the second um, over a period of, you know, 100 to 200 years. Um, but let's consider a more recent example, namely the transition from Newtonian mechanics in physics to something like quantum mechanics. Obviously, there's stuff in between having to do with general relativity and whatnot, you know, yada yada, okay? I'm just trying to give you an understanding of what we mean by uh, paradigms. Now, for Kuhn, when we undergo these paradigmatic shifts, something happens called meaning incommensurability, which essentially makes it impossible to compare our new scientific theories to our old ones because they are two separate paradigms. And this is caused by the fact that the base terms of these theories, um, like the term mass, fundamentally mean different things under one system uh, than in another. So mass under a Newtonian mechanical system just doesn't mean the same thing that it means under a system of quantum mechanics. And so if the meaning of these things are at their very base incommensurable, then there's no real way to compare them. And what Kuhn wanted to argue and did argue in Structures of Scientific Revolutions, although later on he seemed to back off a little bit of this thesis, is that when a scientist enters a new paradigm, fundamentally the world changes. The world itself ontologically changes. And so a paradigmatic shift actually shifts the ontology of the entire world. You literally enter a new world as you undergo a different scientific, uh, or as you enter a new scientific paradigm. Um, and that might seem very spooky to people and might be like, well, isn't that just total like skepticism? Um, and if we want to take Kuhn at his word in his original book, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a very relativistic and skeptical stance. And so my thought was, well, hey, what if we apply Allison's um, interpretation of Kant to something like Kuhn's theory of revolutions and instead interpret scientific, um, scientific uh, paradigm shifts as entailing essentially different ways in which we are interpreting the world the way that we generate representations without saying anything about what's actually changing over here. So the skepticism isn't the same uh, or doesn't appear as vicious as it, as it originally seemed because you're not saying that the things in themselves are changing. All you're saying is that the filter, namely our scientific theories um, and the conditions that are required uh, to be, you know, a particle at this point in space-time, the conditions 
have just changed over the course of uh, of a paradigm shift. Uh, and for Kant, Kant wanted to hold these conditions necessary over all of history. Okay, there is nothing that could ever change these a priori epistemic conditions. But for someone like Kuhn, who thought that these conditions were very much dependent on our socio uh, historical cultural contexts, these conditions actually change. And so the filter is changing. And so to, I think a great way of understanding Kuhn is as essentially advocating for the idea that as we undergo scientific revolutions and paradigm shifts, as we shift from a Copernican model to, or a Ptolemaic model to a Copernican model, as we shift from uh, a, uh, a Newtonian mechanical model of physics to a quantum mechanical one, we are essentially changing the filter by which we come to know scientific objects and scientific knowledge. Uh, and this is not to say that the, like, the things in themselves are changing. It's to say that the way that we're representing objects is changing. And so objectivity and scientific objectivity now becomes divorced from the things in themselves and becomes relegated to the questions um, that come after we've cognized the objects through our scientific theories. Okay, So there's no, in a sense, real objectivity uh, in science under this picture. Um, the objectivity only arises within this specific paradigm. And that's just going to follow from its meaning incommensurability because you can't compare uh, competing scientific paradigms and scientific theories because they're base um, taxonomical terms like mass, velocity, energy. These terms are, are fundamentally different from each other. Um, with the idea of the subconscious being an example of this filter changing. Yeah, I mean, if you're talking about like or, um, I don't know. Uh, so, I mean, the subconscious is a psychological theory, a psychological posit um, that I think is kind of different. Uh, it's on an epistemic condition, I think. It feels a little bit ad hoc, in a sense. I'd have to think about that a bit more. Um, but Kant's filters were the fundamental conditions of experience. How does a shift from Newtonian physics to QM alter my experience? It doesn't. Right. Yeah, yes. So this is where, you know, um, Kuhn differs from Kant because Kuhn thinks that our conditions are uh, specifically only about scientific entities, mind you. He's not saying about this for all of reality. Only our access to the scientific world is changing. Um the shift does alter our experience because the conditions relative to scientific entities and scientific knowledge is changing. So maybe that might make you feel a little bit better. You might reject uh, Kuhn's picture of scientific revolutions. You might think that scientific knowledge is cumulative. Um, although I think most philosophers of science would object to that very strongly nowadays. Would a decent analogy be programming the same game in different languages? It is kind of the same game but not really. Um, I don't think so because mm, I don't know if the game analogy necessarily works because in the context of scientific change there are new entities, and if it's the same game, it would presumably have the same type of entities, but different scientific theories commit ourselves to different types of entities, so I think it would have to be a different game, if that makes sense. Um, isn't this just obviously what Kuhn is saying? Who would disagree and say that a paradigmatic shift equals an actual change in how the world is? I feel like I've missed your point. Um... I'm not totally sure what you mean, uh, Pemulus. How does that affect... You? Oh, he's responding. Uh, like before, someone might not make note of little actions or slip-ups of a person, but now people might be more inclined to 
look at it was subconscious or Freudian slip. So the filter of which we understand is... Yes, that's a... Yes, absolutely. I understand what you mean now. So you're talking about the psycho, like, analytical theory that we've developed. Yes, so positing an actual existing, you know, ego, id, and superego, um, and positing something like, you know, the subconscious in a psychological theory we would be gaining access to a new kind of entity, a new representation of whatever is beyond in the things in themselves. Yes, that, that is exactly right. It's true there's a dialectical relationship between filter and experience, but to a point, right? We necessarily must think in terms of a priori intuition's time, for example, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, Kuhn's example is just about scientific theories and entities. He wouldn't make the same. But you know, talk about someone like Michel Foucault, right, who believed in historicizing uh, epistemic, which is, so it's a very r relativistic uh, view, although I know Foucault's denied charges of relativism, but I mean, let's be real. Um, you know, Foucault believed that these epistemic conditions change over time. Um, so, you know, contra, contra Kant, there aren't these fundamental um a priori conditions through which we can get a grasp at objectivity, right? Uh, contra Kant, these are conditions that are relative to culture, time, um, and geography. Um, and so it sort of takes Kuhn's thesis and it, it generalizes it from the scientific example uh, and scientific knowledge to all knowledge at all, um, which is a very extreme view. Uh, which you may or may not like. But the power of Kant is that I think transcendental arguments are really, really, really great. Um, and I could do a whole stream on the concept of, uh, on the concept of transcendental arguments, but I, I just, I fundamentally believe that they are the foundation of all philosophy. Um, and a transcendental argument is just simply saying, look, we all agree that we have X, right? Let's get at necessary knowledge by asking how it is we have X in the first place. What is necessary in the first place to have X, okay? And so that's why I'm such a big fan of, um, of Donald Davidson, because he uses a transcendental argument um, to secure what he believes to be objectivity, um, in in language and in language and linguistic communication because essentially he says you know as rational agents we have to assume that everyone that we speak to is also a rational agent and that the majority of their beliefs are true beliefs about the world and he argues that by by asking well what is necessary to have a belief in the first place to have a belief about something like that cup is red. I have to have further beliefs about what it means to be a cup and what it means to be red. And if I have beliefs about what it means to be a cup, I need to have beliefs about what it means for me to see a cup. And so we have, in a sense, this web of beliefs, all which are interdependent upon one another. So to have any one true belief, I have to have other true beliefs in order to have that first true belief. And so Essentially, it's a great argument that if the majority of your beliefs are false, then it essentially means that almost all of your beliefs are false, and maybe all of your beliefs are false. So in order to have any beliefs at all, in order to comprehend what our beliefs fundamentally mean, the majority of them have to be true. Um, and you might disagree with that argument. I disagree with that argument, but it's an ingenious argument, and I think it's really, really powerful. Um... Are you familiar with Barry Stroud's criticism? Yes, I am, but I don't want... I, I might do a separate um, video on transcendental argumentation uh, and give a bunch of examples from it because I really like them. They're really fun too, but... Um, stream of REM, reading the transcendental analytic with commentary would be pog, though it would take five weeks. Yeah, I mean, I could do a con reading stream. I just don't know how much... <laughs> I don't know how much people would really, really want that, you know? Um, Hegel over Kant. Yeah, maybe. Uh, aren't argumentation ethics also transcendental argument? I don't know what that means exactly. 
The dilemma you were ta- talking about by the Jacobi uh, guy does not necess- necessitate the belief that causality needs to be defined spatiotemporally, which not everyone believes. Can it be defined by counterfactual stuff? Um, yes, but... Y- yes, but... Count- well, no. Counterfactual claims still make claims about spatiotemporal relationships to one another. One cannot counterfactually... Some, for something to be counterfactually dependent on something else, they have to be spatiotemporally related to one another. Um, in order for any... For, in order for it to be a plausible counterfactual account of causality. I'm, I'm just thinking of Lewis's account. Maybe there's a different account of counterfactuals I don't know about, but as far as I know, I don't think what you're describing is possible. I like this idea, uh, meta-ethics. Like, just take it as given that we believe in moral facts. Our task is to then figure out what makes certain moral claims true, others false. There is no skeptical debunking a la anti-realism. Yeah, well, I mean, that's essentially Kant's entire argument. And I think it's also really powerful because it allows us to sort of dissolve um, this distinction that we draw between epistemic and moral norms. Uh, because if we're going to say that certain things are true, there comes with that a certain sense of obligation that we carry towards beliefs um, that have signifiers of being true, namely that we need to believe that they are true. Um I, I I agree with you. I think it, that's the way that we have to go about it. Why can't I make a counterfactual claim? I can say that I could say without A, then there's no B. Without saying A has any causal relationship with B, right? Um, I I don't I don't really know what what you're referring. I mean, there are counterfactuals that are not um causal in nature but if but if you're you're talking about a theory of causation so of course it has to have a causal relationship um okay i'm gonna go get some water but look if uh you enjoyed oh my throat's getting sore uh if you enjoy if you've enjoyed this so far and i'm not done yet um and you want to keep seeing this type of content uh feel free to sub uh, if you have Amazon Prime, you get a free Twitch Prime sub. You can subscribe just with regular money. Uh, you can donate with bits. Or best way to donate is by clicking the donation button um, down below, uh, which will also do text-to-speech. Um, just give me one second. I am back. See? Super fast. Spatiotemporal causal relationship. I can say that without saying A and B are spatiotemporally related, right? Um, Oh, no, you can't, you can't do that. Um, you'd run into the exact same, you run into the exact same problem, Occam's Razor, because if you want to draw counterfactual dependence between uh, two events, for example, you were going to draw a, a, like a binary relation between two things, which you can't do with a thing in itself. You can't put a thing in itself in a relationship with a particular representation. So... There you go. Um, that was a really interesting idea, merging ma- meta-ethical claims with epistemic ones or sort of moving past anti-realism, if I understood what you were saying correctly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's sort of my big my biggest interest is this unificatory um, account of norms um, and reasons and dissolving, you know, the ideas of truth and the good and just seeing them as uh, being uh, the same type of thing. Um Okay, let me see. Is there anything else I, I want to say 
um, about Kant. Um, Uh, why can't there be thing in themselves have a relationship with subjectivity? Isn't that the whole philosophy? Like, to consider the thing in itself is essentially to consider a something divorced from the epistemic relationships that it has towards the human subject. And an epistemic, any sort of, any sort of counterfactual relationship that you want to lay down is going to be using our epistemic conditions. Um, to think of something, to consider something as it is in itself, to think of the thing in itself, to think of the transcendental object means being divorced completely from all epistemic conditions involving the conditions necessary for counterfactual thought, if that makes sense. Does that make sense to you? Have you watched Footnotes of Plato at all? He's a pretty cool German idealist guy. No, I'll have to check that out, actually. Um, let's see here. I also want to do a, uh, oh, did I upload? Let me, let me check this one second. Um, did I upload yesterday's stream or no? Yes, I did. Yes. So if you haven't seen yet, I uploaded yesterday's, um, stream on YouTube. Uh, which, where I talked about philosophy of disability and stuff, um, which I think everyone uh, should watch. I thought it was a very good stream. Um, and I'll be uploading every single VOD that I make from now on, just so you know, um, which should be good because we're going to be hyperactive. Uh, and the goal is to do... I'm thinking of doing three or four of these types of lecture streams a week and then one or two other streams. Maybe we're engaged more with like, oh, what's going on in the fucking Twitch world? Who's being a dumbass today? You know, um, who's talking about pedophilia this time? <laughs> you know, because that, that's the content that certain people want. And then... People also want, you know, me to talk about philosophy. And although people say, you know, try to talk about the philosophy behind a lot of, uh, like, this Twitch drama, there's only so much you can really do um, at the end of the day. Um, so, you know. Have you considered starting the Rem Royale and Beaning on Wes and Cutie Cinderella? Oh my god, the Rem Royale. Wow, I haven't even considered this. The Rem Royale. Yeah, what if I just did a panel show of like really controversial ideas? Like just a two hour Rem Royale debating like saying the n-word in private <laughs> and like that's it hmm that is interesting that is interesting rem royale i kind of hate debate shows but maybe i hate debate shows because they're run poorly the issue is like do i do it like a voting system where people get voted off or do I, am I the ultimate judge and uh, don't go too controversial? Well, no, I don't mean that controversial. But do I do it so that I'm the ultimate judge and arbiter or what? I don't know. I'm not sure. I honestly, I like it most because I like the name. I like the name Rem Royale. It's a fun name, you know? Um, yeah, I should really look into that. I think that's a good idea. Um, Attila, Attila the second. Uh, but also we have D and D coming up. I've got a big D and D campaign that I've been working really hard on with some really awesome people. Um, that will be starting very soon. 
uh, and we'll be using Roll20, and you'll see everybody's faces, and it'll be really fun. Then we also have this panel game show coming up. So there's a lot of stuff coming up. Um, so your interest in Kant is more in his metaphysics epistemology rather than his ethics. Oh, no, no, no. I'm most interested in his ethics, but you can't really understand his ethics without understanding his metaphysics and epistemology first. Also, third critique better than first critique. The third critique is the only critique I haven't read. Um, I need to do that. It's, again, very long. It's a big commitment. Well, I like that idea, and the name just rolls off the tongue. Reminds me of something else. Yeah, exactly. I don't know if I follow what you said right, but were you saying that our foundation for ideas about counterfactual reasoning are from spatiotemporal relations? No, only that to think... So, to say anything about things in themselves, that essentially means thinking about them apart from our own epistemic conditions. And any sort of counterfactual, which is a logical relationship, counter, a counterfactual relationship is a modal, it's, it's derived in modal logic. And these are these are epistemic conditions. Ep, the, whatever epistemic conditions we have are modal operators, right? So to try to put a thing in itself in a modal operator is impossible because to even talk about a thing in itself, you're doing so separate from epistemic conditions. Uh, can you explain Korsgaard's argument that Kant has misapplied the categorical imperative when talking about the right to lie? I don't know Korsgaard's argument about that. Um, so I'd have to read on it first. I'm sorry. Um, okay. Wait. So a lot of people are freaking out. Someone, I'm in a group chat. Did something happen with Mr. Girl? Hmm. I thought you linked it on Discord once. My bad. I don't think so. Maybe I did. I don't. I don't recall that. Okay, but look. Um, why can't you talk about it? Separate? Okay. Um, you message in the Discord maybe, and I might be able to answer. I, I've got to go. Um, because I've got some stuff to finish up tonight. Um, but look, if you liked this stream and you want to keep watching this sort of content. Uh, and you want to see more long form content, uh, you know how you can support me. I've already said, uh, and, uh, follow me if you're not following me and follow my Twitter and my YouTube too, which are, um, both here. Uh, and I will be streaming again tomorrow. Um, I'll do a poll on Twitter to see like what I'll do a lecture on then, but I might do another one on Kant. I don't know. Uh, I'll just have to see the kind of response um, that we get. But yeah, look, if you want to help me, if you're watching this after the fact, for example, and you want to support, feel free to, because I always shout out those who support and donate off stream and you can watch the pod back, whatever. But uh, thanks everyone who tuned in. I uh, I hope you guys have a good uh, rest of your night um, and I'll, I'll see you guys tomorrow, okay? Oh, maybe we can raid someone. Um, I'm not very good at raiding. I don't really know who I can raid. Well, let's do it. Roll raid. Uh, we will raid. Oh boy. Oh, we'll raid uh, Chud Logic. Yes. Oh, yes. Look, that's exactly who I was thinking. Perfect. Great idea. Great idea, Monty. Okay. I, uh, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye.